for the church, and the second collection is for Beacon Home. And our call to worship comes to us from Revelation 15, verses 3 and 4. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Let us now sing our pre-service hymn, hymn 248, verses 1, 4, and 5. So 248, 1, 4, and 5. Beloved congregation, as we draw near to the Lord in worship once again, we do so confessing that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heavens and the earth. Amen. Receive the Lord's greeting. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead 
and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Amen. Let's sing to the Lord's praise, Psalter 15, stanzas 1, 2, and 3, Psalter 15, titled God's Glory in His Works. Beloved congregation, our scripture reading for this afternoon service is found in two places. First, we'll have our Old Testament reading. That's coming from Psalm 139. Continuing what we were studying this morning, now looking at the third stanza of Psalm 139, page 969 in the Pew Bible. The third stanza goes from verse 13 through to verse 18. We'll read that, but then we'll keep reading to the end of the chapter, end of the psalm. And then we'll turn to the New Testament, and our New Testament reading is uh, actually 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 10. But first, let's read Psalm 139, verse 13 through 24. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. 
Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's turn now to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll read verses 5 through 10. This is page 1777. Really, the key verse we're looking at here is uh, verse 7. But let's read verse 5 through 10. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Thus far, the reading of God's holy, infallible, and precious word, may he write his truth upon our hearts. Congregation, at this time, we'd like to confess our unity with the Catholic Church. When we say Catholic, we don't mean Roman Catholic, but we mean the universal church, uh, the church of all ages and all places. And we confess our faith uh, with the universal church using the words of the Apostles' Creed, answering the question, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing out of response Psalter 85, stanzas 1, 2, and 3, titled The Praise of the Almighty God. Psalter 85, all three stanzas.
We'll have a congregation at this time. Let's turn to our triune God in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, what a great thing it is that, Father, in your grace, you have chosen for yourself a people united to Christ, chosen before the foundation of the world, that they might be completely redeemed and accepted in the beloved. And Father, then it's in Christ that we draw near to you this afternoon with your Spirit's help, crying out, Abba, Father. And what a great thing it is that we can know that though we have often sinned against you, and though we still have strong tendencies to sin, yet for all who have embraced Christ with the empty hand of faith, we can come to you, our maker, our sustainer, and we can call you Father. O oh Lord, we pray that you would help us who are your children to understand what's all contained in that name. That we would tremble with joy. That we would be struck with awe and amazement that we have access unto you, the holy, good, life-giving God. And Father, our desire this afternoon is that your name might be hallowed, that it might be clearly set apart from any other name, that the glory of your person would be seen in the glory of Christ. For your glory shines most radiantly in the face of Jesus. And so, Father, may our worship be Christ-centered this afternoon. May we see that in him, all the promises of God are yes and amen. That he is the all and in all. And so, Father, help us to know you through the Lord Jesus. For any other view of you is wrong. It's idolatrous. It's a distortion of the truth, and it leads us away from you. And so, Father, we confess our tendency to idolatry, and we thank you that you are so filled with compassion and grace and love that you are here again to renew our minds, to help us understand more of who you are, to know you, and in knowing you, to enjoy eternal life. Father, we pray that we would know you and that we would treasure you, that you would be most supreme in our lives, that you would take the central place again. Lord, every day, every week, we need to be reset. We so easily drift into centering our lives on ourselves. And Lord, we need you at the center. And we pray that we would then show others through our love for you, through our enjoyment of you, through our honoring of you, through our obedience to you, that you truly are most glorious, most delightful. And so in that way, may your name be hallowed. May your kingdom come, Father. Also this day, we praise you that through your Son, who is seated at your right hand, you are building your church and that the gates of hell cannot prevail against her, and that this day countless numbers have gathered all over this world to worship you, the triune God. And Father, we praise you then that though we often see the darkness and we see our own darkness and our own weakness and the opposition in this world, yet give us the long-term perspective of church history as well, which shows us that you've been faithful to your promises, 
that for thousands of years you are gathering, you have been gathering a people to yourself. And on that final day, there will be a number of, that's so great that no man can number it, of people from all different tribes and languages and skin colors and cultures surrounding the throne of Christ. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, bring in the fullness of your kingdom. Oh, Lord, we live in this cursed world, and there's so much brokenness. And many of us, we all, to varying degrees, feel the brokenness. The creation groans as we live under the curse. And our own bodies are breaking down, and our own minds are so often breaking and Lord, we we see that we are but dust. Help us to come to grips with that reality. But Lord, also we pray that you would give us great hope, again, that's rooted in Christ, rooted in the resurrection, rooted in his irreversible works that he performed on the cross, but also the empty tomb when he rose from the dead as the first fruits of of that final great uh, resurrection. And so, Lord Jesus, help us to know that you are king and that you are building your church. Be with your persecuted people. Encourage them, strengthen them. Also, remember your church here in Canada as we see so much darkness around us. Lord, we think in particular of the darkness of abortion and the murdering of children in the womb. Lord, it grieves us that 300 babies every day are slaughtered just in our land and 900,000 slaughtered in America every year. And Lord, we pray that you would bring an end to the bloodshed and that the gospel light of Christ would prevail. Lord, help us to be faithful voices for those who do not have a voice. We, we pray that you would help us to speak up for the children. Lord, also help us to care for so many of the pregnant mothers who are in difficult circumstances and for the fathers that they might not be absentee fathers, but that they might be there. And Lord, that our nation would humble ourselves before you and find that you are the God who is rich in mercy and that your ways are good and that they promote life and flourishing. Lord, help us to be faithful witnesses of the gospel of Christ to our neighbors. We thank you for uh, the many people you've placed in our lives, our, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues. Um, we thank you that uh, in your common grace, many of them are a blessing to us. And yet, Lord, how they need what we have. And so help us to be faithful witnesses. Lord, you bring in your kingdom through, through those who are weak. You do not choose many who are wise, but you choose those who in themselves are foolish and weak, like the Apostle Paul, like us. And Lord, it's through weakest means that you fulfill your will. And so help us to get rid of all of our excuses and to go forward with joy and gladness, speaking of the most beautiful, life-giving King. And so, Lord, we thank you for the opportunities you will give us this week. And we pray that you would help us with your spirit to take them. And, Lord, that you would do more than we can think or ask, that the fruit would be eternal fruit. And though we might never see it in our lifetime, may we trust that your word never returns to you empty or void. Lord, we also pray for those in our midst who are expecting children. Lord, strengthen and uphold them. And we pray that uh, healthy children would be born and that you would care for the mothers. And Lord, we thank you for uh, all people, uh, also those who struggle with disabilities. Lord, we thank you that they are made in your image. And we thank you then for Beacon Home and for the great work that they're doing in Dunville as they support those in need. Lord, we thank you also for our sister, Debbie Veenstra, being able to join us this afternoon. We praise you for her. We pray your blessing upon her. Lord, we pray for uh, couples who are married and who would love to have children, but who cannot and who bear that 
deep grief, Lord, uphold and strengthen them and may your word also be a balm of comfort to their souls. Lord, we pray for the needy in our community. We thank you that uh, Harvest Kitchen is able to make and serve meals on Tuesday. And Lord, we think of the many in Welland who have so little and we have so much and we thank you for all the gifts. And Lord, help us to continue to have open hands to receive from you and also open hands to give from you to others. Lord, bless us in every way. Also, feed us now with the bread of life. And we ask this all, confessing our sin and praising you for the forgiveness that's found in Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Beloved congregation, at this time, we have the opportunity to give to the Lord again from our gifts. Uh, Once again, the collection, the first collection is for the church, and the second collection is for Beacon Home. Following that, we will sing Psalter 275, all four stanzas titled The Covenant God and His Church, 275, 1 through 4.
Beloved congregation, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles once again to Psalm 139. And I'd like to read verse, verses 13 and 14. Page 969, Psalter 139, verse 13 and 14. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Dear congregation, Everywhere we turn, the world is telling us that we need to be more if we want to be something special. You need to be more put together. You need to be more beautiful. You need to be smarter or richer or cooler. You need to be more athletic, more cutting edge more popular. You need to be more if you want to be something or someone. And so we're told true joy and true satisfaction flow from being more of these things. If you want to have value, then show me what you got. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. It's survival of the fittest. So give me your resume, and I'll tell you what you're worth. That's one dominant message in our world today. But on the other hand, there's another message that's maybe equally dominant, and it sounds like this. You are enough. Stop trying to be more. You're good enough. Quit dwelling on your flaws. Start accepting yourself. No one is perfect. We all make mistakes. You are enough. And so here's how one popular song that came out last year put it. It's titled, You Are Enough. It has millions of listens. It describes someone who's being emotionally beat up by trying to be a people pleaser. And this is how the song goes. You bleed emotion so devoted to what people say Give second chances left and right and only take the blame. Here's the key line. Don't change a single thing because there is nothing wrong with you. What you feel now, don't make it truth. You are enough. And then six times, you are enough. You are enough. You are enough. You are enough. That's the mantra. You are enough. And so what is it? Do we need to be more to have worth? Because obviously we aren't enough. Or are we enough and we don't need to change a single thing except maybe add a little bit more of that self-acceptance whipped cream on the top. Just accept yourself some more and you're fine. Which one is it? Well, the answer is option C. None of the above. Uh, both of these are so wrapped up with ourselves, and therefore, you can know that it will drag you down to disaster. The Archbishop William Temple uh, pinpointed the problem so well when he wrote this. Our sin means that we make ourselves, in a thousand different ways, the center of the universe. And both of these popular ideas are just different ways of doing that. Making ourselves the center of the universe. And what we need is to have the triune God enter the picture for him to become the center of our universe. We need, yes, you guessed it, we need good theology. Because, oh, I love theology is what I hope you're saying now as we've been studying Psalm 139. Theology is great. It gives life to the soul to know God. And it's as we come to know and love the triune God in Christ that we can come to know and love ourselves appropriately and find our true value and discover our true purpose in him. 
And that's what we're looking at this afternoon, that our title is God Made Me. God Made Me. We have two points. First, notice the best artisan. The best artisan. I wonder how many of us have thought something like this. I will never be pretty or good looking enough. Here's a staggering stat for you. 90% of young ladies are not happy with their appearance. 90%. Nine out of 10 young ladies are not happy with their appearance. I'm too skinny or I'm too fat. I'm too tall or I'm too short. I'm too ugly. Even some who are surveyed wrote this, I'm too attractive. Because why do people keep looking at me? I just wish I wouldn't get all this attention. Congregation, it's easy for many of us, not only young ladies, but for many of us to be eaten up with discontentment over our body image. Or if it's not body image, then maybe it's other people's success or their skills or their wit or their popularity. This discontentment so often is blended together with jealousy or envy. And congregation, it's even possible that in our own fellowship, there are people that you walk by and your jaw tightens because, oh, it's them. Internally despising them. Or maybe inwardly you smirk and think, ha, at least I'm not like them. How can that be? Well, congregation, the Lord knows that we are petty. The Lord knows that we're vicious, and he has a cure for us. And that's found for us in the verses 13 to 16. He's reminding us that he is the best artisan. Now, an artisan, children, maybe you're wondering, what what is this artisan? Well, you can think, when you hear artisan, you can hear artist. Uh, An artisan is a skilled craftsman. And notice David highlights this two ways in these verses. Uh, The first comes in verses 13 and 15, where you can write over those two verses, the Lord is my potter. The Lord is my potter, my artisan. Verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. Beloved, when's the last time you brought your sense of self-worth or body image into contact with this text? Lord, you formed my inward parts. And there David is highlighting how absolutely pervasively the Lord's work goes in us. Not just the externals, but to to the very core. He formed the inward parts. Literally, the word is my kidneys. Lord, you formed my kidneys, my inward parts, and everything else about me. He shaped me. He created me the inside and the outside, he lovingly covered me in my mother's womb. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. They're speaking of the God of heaven and comparing that to the mother's womb. The God of heaven stooping to skillfully work me and frame me and shape me in my mother's womb. And so this is the truth of everyone on earth. Do you see those words? You should probably highlight them or write them down in bold. Skillfully wrought. Skillfully made. We are all the handiwork of God. We can all look in the mirror and say this. I am the skillful work of the best artisan in the universe. Now, congregation, uh, handmade markets are a big deal these days. Uh, In the summer, almost every weekend, you can find a handmade market to go to if you want to. Handmade candles, handmade jewelry, handmade wood carvings, whatever you want, handmade. And yet, every day you get to look at the handiwork of God. Uh, The potter has shaped and fashioned you and me and everyone. And so it's as if we're constantly walking in God's handmade market. And we're constantly looking at his products on display. Each one made skillfully 
and carefully. Look at verse 16. The first part of that verse. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And David is here picturing the Lord's skillful eye, the skillful eye of the craftsman, as he's watching the baby in the womb. You saw my substance being yet unformed. The Lord was there from the moment of conception, causing the conception. Uh, When the human child was just an embryo, so small, so fragile, the Lord's eye is watching. And day after day, then the Lord, the careful craftsman, watches and works on developing the child in the womb. Amazingly, at week two, the baby's brain is already developing. We know this now due to science and being able to observe the Lord's handiwork. Week two, the baby's brain is developing, quickly followed by the heart. Uh, Week three, that heart begins to beat. Week four and five, eyes and lungs are growing and kidneys are forming. Week six, brain waves begin. Uh, Little hands and feet have appeared. They start to move. The baby can rotate his or her head. He can even have the hiccups at week six. Week eight, the baby girl already has eggs in her ovaries for the future generation. She can suck her thumb. She can move her tongue. She can sigh. She can stretch. Eight weeks in the mother's womb. We can go on, but at each stage, it's, Lord, you formed me. In congregation, then, the the genius of the all-wise God is seen in every single human being. Now, the application here is obvious. The Christian worldview is beautifully pro-life. 3,000 years ago, when this was first penned, there was no confusion about what was in the pregnant mother. David says, it's a human. Notice, that was me in there. Uh, the same me that's now writing the psalm, only now I'm just a little more mature. A further, I'm further along in development. But just like I'm more developed now than when I was at age 20 or age 10 or age 10 months or one day old, that doesn't mean I was less human back then. I was a human being, less developed, smaller, and the same is true at day one as it is the day before day one in the mother's womb when I was sheltered there. It was me there. God made me, God made you, he made every child in the womb, each is valuable like the mother carrying the child and it's worth protecting. Now, of course, since life is so precious, This makes abortion evil, wrong. Many don't understand. Many do understand and continue. And the only thing that can cure and forgive and help is surely the precious blood of the Son of God. And he spills it even for those who have committed these crimes. But also, since life is so precious, this makes things like miscarriage and infertility so challenging. What a grief it is when in our Father's mysterious providence, this precious gift is taken away. And I imagine for some of us, these words might be hard to read. These beautiful words might be hard to read. Just as David marveled over the wonders of life, he mourned over pain of death as his seven-day old baby died and his older son Absalom died, two very different circumstances. But as Christians, with a Christian's wor- Christian worldview, surely we ought to be those who weep with those who weep in this regard. Life is precious. Children are precious. And when in, fa- in the Father's mysterious providence, these things are taken from us, it's worth grieving over in the knowledge of his goodness over all things as well. But there's something here in these verses that we must not miss. Uh, Maybe you think as you read these words, these verses, I can picture uh, these Bible verses being posted on the caption of a picture of a baby in the womb. Maybe you've seen billboards like that. Those are good billboards. Or maybe you've seen these verses posted on a picture of a young, bright-eyed person with a beautiful smile. And yeah, that seems to make sense. But here's the problem. You see those pictures and you start to include, well, this verse isn't about me, obviously. I don't look that beautiful or that bright. 
And yet, congregation, we need to see that these verses can caption any picture of any person. There's rich application here for me and for you in our self-understanding. David is singing this of himself after many years of life experience. These truths are shaping his view of himself. God made me. David still hasn't gone over the marvel of that. Years on, years later, he's thinking, first of all, of himself here. God is my potter. And so these verses, they belong as a caption on every picture of every person. It's true of the cancer patient wasting away in bed after treatment upon treatment of radiation. It's true about the self-conscious person whose acne is a bit too thick for their liking. It's true about the person whose mind feels broken as the intrusive thoughts continue to swarm in. It's true about the senior who once could run but now struggles to walk, who once could lead a meeting and speak in public but now struggles to talk, who once could problem solve but now struggles to remember anything. These verses are true of every single person. The caption over every person is, God made me. Verse 16, and in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. So this is why I chose God is my artisan, because God is the artist, but God is also my author. Do you see that? David's speaking about a book and our days being written in them before the, the, the story of our life started. Uh, the Lord's written the days of our life. We're not to cut our story short by taking our life into our own hands. Instead, we are to daily surrender ourselves unto this gracious potter who loves to save and to care for sinners who are suffering. And one way to surrender is by embracing the second key truth. Not only is the Lord my potter, but second, under this first point, I am his clay. I am his clay. Notice, uh, this is what is implied in David's language of being formed and molded. Children, you picture maybe Plato being formed and molded. Well, in David's time, it was clay that was formed and molded. Made by God. And what is implied in David's language is made explicit in Paul's language. So please turn with me back to 2 Corinthians 4. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Notice how Paul adopts this language. It's page 1777 in the Pew Bible. Here's Paul's view of himself, verse 7. It's very healthy. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's his understanding of himself. It's not exactly flattering. Literally, you can translate that as we have this treasure in clay pots. Cheap pots. The ones you'd find in every house in Paul's day. Uh, The Tupperware that gets, you know, stained with the tomato soup and it just stays orange now. Cheap pots. Ordinary pots that get chipped and cracked, that's a key part of Paul's self understanding. And it's totally countercultural. Because Corinth was all about puffing up ourselves. And in that context, Paul says, I'm not that impressive. I'm just a clay pot. And friend, I wonder then, is this your balanced view of yourself? We need these two truths going together. First, I am an image bearer of God. I have value because he made me. And right away combined with that second, I'm not that impressive. I'm an image image bearer, but I'm not that impressive. I'm a clay pot, specifically designed and shaped by God. And yet due to the fall, I have many cracks and flaws. Friends, it's by grasping this, we can utterly transform our view of life and our view of ourselves. Because let me ask you, do you ever find yourself saying things like this? If only, if only I didn't have this weakness. If only I didn't have this limitation, then 
I could really live life. Then I could find my purpose and be filled, fulfilled. Then I could be useful. Those are understandable thoughts, and yet they're absolutely wrong thoughts when we see the gospel. Because all of that implies that God, our good creator, our sovereign father, made a mistake when he made you. And he didn't. Now, I'm not talking about the sin in our life. That needs to go. Get rid of it now. Battle that. Bring it to the cross. Crucify it daily. Chop off hands. Pluck out eyes. Kill sin through the blood of Christ. But I'm talking about weakness. The things we see in the mirror that we want to hide. Aspects of us that we find embarrassing. Notice Paul looks at his many weaknesses and limitations and he doesn't despair. He actually has a rock solid confidence and a settled peace in his heart. And the question I'm asking and you should be asking is how is that possible? Well, that takes us to our second and final point. How is it possible to live this way like Paul? where he's not being totally bombarded with a sense of his weaknesses as that which debilitates him. Our second point is the best aim. So we have first the best artisan, second the best aim. The greatest artist has a great aim for my life. The good creator has a good purpose for me. There's a reason why he has designed me the way he has. There's a reason why he's writing my story the way he is. And that's what Paul's getting at in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Notice, let me read the whole verse here. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels for a purpose. No mistakes here. For a purpose. Clay pots, chipped ones, cracked ones. For a purpose. Why? What's the purpose? That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. This is so critical because this is what enables Paul to live at peace with his weaknesses. With his limitations, he can stare them in the face and yet he can do so and live at peace because he's able to recognize and embrace this one crucial thing. Life isn't about me. The reason for my existence is not that others would see how great I am, how strong I am, how special I am. And friends, this is what we all live for due to our fallen hearts. I want others to be impressed with me. I am very impressive. Please, please notice it. I want others to notice my beauty and my brilliance. So when I see cracks in my container, when I see the chips in my pot, I can't handle it because that is robbing me of my greatest desire that others would bow to me and just be in awe of me. And Paul is saying the only way to be liberated from that is to recognize that life is about God. The creator's good purpose for us is to showcase his excellency through us. Verse 7, we're intentionally made as weak clay pots that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, we need to see the picture of this text um, to help us understand the truth being communicated here. Imagine uh, you walked into church this afternoon and there was, there was the biggest soup pot we could find and we have some big soup pots don't we for our sunday soup so we had a competition we all brought our biggest soup pot and we put it right here in the front we chose the biggest one the biggest soup pot put it in the middle and it's filled with gold and diamonds and sparkling gems it's overflowing to the brim and you walk forward, you pick up the pot, and you just dump out all that treasure, and you stand there admiring this old soup pan. Oh, isn't it beautiful? Look at that pot. We would think you're nuts. Absolutely crazy. We aren't meant to be impressed with the pot. We should be impressed with the treasure. And yet, friends, so much of the pain in our life comes from reversing that. We seek to be impressed with the pot and we forget about the treasure. 
And notice when Paul speaks of treasure, he's referring to the previous verse right before it. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God, which is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, that's the sparkling treasure in the soup pan. In the clay pot, God's radiant, splendid glory seen in Jesus Christ. And yet, so many of us spend a lot more time thinking about the clay pot ourselves while forgetting about the treasure, Christ. And so we say things like this to ourselves, I'm worthless because nobody likes me. I'm worthless because I never win. I'm worthless because of what happened to me or I'm worthless because of what people think about me. And all of that, thinking that we all do so often, is tying our worth to me and my own reasons for my existence. And if we do that, then we're swimming against the current of the creator's good purpose. It's like trying to swim up the Niagara Falls. Think about that for a minute. We can't do it. Try to swim up the Niagara Falls. It's impossible. Instead, we need to align ourselves with our creator, and it's as we do that we discover that he is good. In fact, he's so gracious that he entered into our weakness that he might save us from our sin and bring us unto him. That's the gospel. It's this truly life-giving, liberating message that then once we have been embraced by God in Christ, he gives us purpose. Meaning, and he can use pots that are chipped and cracked in so many ways. And it's this creating, saving God that David is marveling over in our psalm. Listen to Psalm 139, verse 17 and 18. Verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God, How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they'd be more in number than the sand. When I awake, and there David's alluding to the resurrection, that great awakening, when there will be no more chips and cracks, but the creation will be utterly restored. When I awake, I am still with you. David the sinner is singing. David the adulterer, David the murderer, David the proud, selfish king who numbered the people and got thousands of them killed due to his pride. He's singing because he's learning to stand amazed at the fact that the saving Lord in his grace thinks on him. And the Lord's thoughts aren't to destroy him or to rob him of his joy or to belittle him. The Lord thinks on him in love for his good. It's almost too good to be true. And yet, friends, this is the Christian message. This is the gospel. It's the happiest news in the world for sinners. And yet, how many people stay in bondage because they refuse to believe what almost sounds too good to be true? We could be plugging our ears right now saying there's just no way that the best, most beautiful, most holy, most important being in the universe would care to think about little old me. It all sounds so unbelievable, and if it does sound so unbelievable, then go back and read the gospel, because prepare to be surprised. There is the love of our creator radically displayed in the person of Jesus Christ. He chose to become ugly. Read Isaiah 53. None wanted him. We were ashamed to be numbered with him because he was ugly in our sight, so deformed, so despised on that cross, made an open shame, hanging there naked, public spectacle, crucified, this this worst of deaths, all so that he might pay for the sins of those who are morally crooked and cruel. That's the gospel, that the creator would do all this. And notice, it's as we grow in our knowledge of our God, our creator and savior, that we then discover our true aim in life. Look at verse 14 of Psalm 139. Verse 14 of Psalm 149, 139, excuse me. I will praise you 
For I am fearfully, that is delightfully, it makes me tremble how delightfully and wonderfully I've been made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Notice, here we find the aim for the clay. What, what's the clay's aim? Well, notice David is now amazed at God, at the maker. He's impressed with him. This is worship. It's a life that's being recentered on God. And therefore, in Christ, he begins to do what he was made to do, to be an image bearer, to reflect the greatness of the potter, to reflect the greatness of this God to this world. And that's exactly what Paul has been talking about, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So don't you see the great liberating aim in life is this. God made me, yes, he made me to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. And it's when God's purposes for us become our purposes that we're freed up to embrace our weaknesses instead of being crushed by them. Then we stop despising God as if he made a mistake, and we stop despising ourselves as if we are a mistake. And we start to see that whatever our limitations and weaknesses are, we have a glorious purpose. God is calling us, inviting us to know him and to honor him, and he can easily do that with whatever weaknesses we have. Listen to Johnny Erickson Tata. Uh, she was age 17 when she had her diving accident. Very healthy, lead, uh, captain of a lacrosse team. She dove and she became a quadriplegic and has lived that way for many years. But here she's writing about something as debilitating as Down syndrome. And listen to what she writes. Just because a person was born with an extra chromosome resulting in Down syndrome, it doesn't mean God made an error. Far from it. God doesn't take his hands off those chromosomes for a nanosecond when he's knitting them together in a mother's womb. Although children and adults with Down syndrome may have distinguishing physical characteristics, it's what inside that counts. Characteristics like patience, perseverance, kindness. And did I mention joy? So many of my friends who live with Down syndrome exhibit such joy and kindness. They enjoy serving and they love working when possible. And they love doing it in community. And isn't that true? God can be marvelously glorified through the crooked, simple smile of a boy with disabilities. And God is grievously dishonored through the self-centered pride of a boy scoring a great goal to the glory of his own name. God created us all. He created us with a purpose. Life is worth living no matter how hard it gets. And when we grasp what Paul and David are saying about how God works through our weaknesses, then we start to pray, O oh God, may Christ shine through the cracks in my earthen vessel. And so let me put it to you in the form of a question. Have you ever considered that your weaknesses might actually be the very things that make you most useful in fulfilling your God-given purpose, namely to glorify and enjoy him. Your battles with anxiety, your weak physical health, your less than desirable outward appearance, whatever your weakness is, can actually be the very platform on which God chooses to make his excellency known and rejoiced in. Yes, our weaknesses often get in the way of our own desires and plans for ourselves, but they don't get in the way of Christ's better plans for us. In fact, they're often Christ's greatest tool in our lives because what's the deadliest thing in our lives? Answer our pride again, our self reliance, our independence from God, the clay thinking that it is the potter, that's the worst thing that can happen. And God uses our weaknesses to attack that tendency in us. Weakness, when sanctified by the Spirit, humbles us. Weakness forces us to pray. Weakness causes us to depend on him. And this is what Paul is so excited about. 
Paul who prayed that the thorn would be taken away. And it's not wrong to pray that. He prayed it three times. And yet he came to a point of hearing the answer, my grace is sufficient for you. Don't think that your limitations and weaknesses are limiting the almighty God. Now, none of this means you shouldn't do your best and use the gifts God has given you to the fullest. It's actually just the opposite. The person who grasps these things has been freed up from the love of self and now loves their creator and their Christ and they want to use their good gifts that God has given them. Maybe it's just a few loaves and a couple fish and they want to use it to the glory of this God. And so they recognize that there is, a, there is work to do. There's a God to serve. There's people to love and the almighty God isn't limited by our weaknesses. Well, the purpose of the clay pot is to hold the treasure. Is Christ your treasure? If so, then it doesn't matter how weak you are or what your limitations are. Pursue the glory of Christ by knowing him, by seeing his love and showing that love to others. And he will ensure that his breathtaking glory will be displayed through you in his own way. And like David, you can more and more say, here's the purpose of my life. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Let's sing Psalter 383, all five stanzas. 383. 383, coming from Psalm 139, stanzas 1 through 5.
Let's close in Thanksgiving prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing handiwork that every person has been made by you and for you. And Lord, may we all realize our purpose then. Free us from the lies of our age, which so often swirl in our minds day after day after day. Free us by your truth that we might know the great joy of being clay in the potter's hands. Lord, use us. Use our weaknesses to spread more of the light and knowledge and love of Christ. And Lord, help us to stop thinking that you are limited by our weaknesses. Lord, we thank you for every mother in our culture that chooses to go full term with babies who have Down syndrome or cerebral palsy or autism or any type of disability with all the pressure to end that pregnancy. Lord, we pray that you would bless these mothers and families and we praise you for the precious child who's made in your image. Lord, we thank you that you have a purpose for their lives, that in their own unique circumstances, they too can live for your glory. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would put an end to the culture of death and the culture of self-sufficiency that lives in us as well, which also casts doubt about the value of each life. Lord, we thank you that your truth sets us free. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing our closing Psalter. Psalter 426, stanza 1, 3, and 7. 426, 1, 3, and 7.
Following the benediction, we'll sing for doxology, Psalter 239, stanzas one and two, and speaking of self-image, self-worth, uh, don't you love the words of Psalm 87, where we get the Lord's view of his people and how he dearly loves each one of his. Receive the Lord's blessing and go in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.